today as well, um, just in case you do need to refer to the material, you know, at a later point in time, or if there are others as well um, that weren't able to make it today. Um, but welcome everybody to uh, a micro learning session. Um, a, a couple, a new idea that we're sort of trialing, experimenting with um, at the end of uh, every PI, where we can look at a number of different challenges that we've, you know, occurred together, experienced together throughout the PI. Uh, and, and look at, you know, sort of building some short and sharp sessions where we can potentially take away something new that we didn't know before, again, that we can trial again in the next PI. Um, and estimating work uh, was certainly one of those common themes um, throughout a lot of the different squads. So um, if you didn't see in the meeting invite, these sessions are completely optional. There is no obligation to attend. Um, and hopefully if you would do enjoy the experience, we can do more of them more often. Um, so again, guided by all of you uh, and keen to rope in many other people who are experts in all sorts of different domains um, to again, provide bite-sized pieces of education um, that can uplift our ability to work with each other um, increasingly as, as sort of time goes on there. So a little bit about, you know, those micro learning sessions and there's two others as well on this afternoon. Um, and if you've got other ideas, other topics, other challenges, please voice them because it's uh, somewhat, well, not simple, but we can look to, to build really good training programs around some of the common issues that we have. So let's get underway and I'll do my best to stick to time uh, today. Um, and if you do sort of have any questions, um, put them through in the chat as well. Um, we'll try and get to them as time goes on. If not, we can uh, sort of take them offline at the end of the session. So what will we be getting our hands somewhat dirty with today? Um, we'll be looking at a couple of different estimation techniques, one that you might be familiar with and things that sort of around time, uh, and a different approach again to how you can start applying that to your own product backlogs. Um, a couple of prerequisites uh, that we sort of might need to have in order to estimate with some of these new techniques, uh, and I'll touch on them um, in a fair bit more depth and why they're important. Um, how to apply some of these practices and techniques to your own squads in time for bigger and planning on next Monday, Tuesday, or sprint planning next week. Um, hopefully with the prospect of helping your squads go through this process and forecasting the future and tackled on with that as well as how we can use some of that data there to drive improvement, increase the control that we have as well um, throughout our sprints and trying to limit that volatility there. And tacked onto that at the end, there is a, a couple of uh, key pitfalls or, or things that we can easily you know, fall into um, that can derail this approach uh, and just be mindful of moving forward. Um, so hopefully that gives you a good idea on what we're gonna cover in the next uh, 25 minutes. So depending on your role, your experience as well, maybe in past careers, most of us have been um, thrown into a situation where we've been asked, how long is it gonna take to build this thing? Or we've got to deliver this thing by X date. Are you gonna be all right with that? And it's kind of a rhetorical question. Um, or can you provide a ballpark figure there um, by a certain time, like i.e. on Friday? And the answer to a lot of those questions before you actually commit to something is, well, how long is a piece of string? Depending on the environment that you work in, uh, the complexity can drastically change the estimates that we do provide. Um, and there's of course a number of, inher of inherent challenges with that. So in this case, estimating you know, work, how big something is, how long it's gonna take, can sometimes be more of an art form than it can be a science. Um, and a lot of us can be expected to provide some of these estimates upfront, commit to them, and, and they go into big plans and scary reports and all sorts of other high level meetings and can cause a lot of friction there. So um, it's acknowledging what does happen on the ground. And again, some of you may be exposed to this, others perhaps not. Um, but this has been going on for quite some time. And the goal is to try and see if we can find different approaches to doing this within our teams. So to take more of a practical example, if you've all got um, just on your browsers or if you've got a mobile phone handy, if you could just open up a new tab, go to menti.com, you'll see up the very top of this of the screen and insert the code, you see it up the top there, 6509-1403. Um, we've got uh, about 13, 14 people in this session um, uh, that can participate in this one. So open that one up, let me know if there's any issues with that one. Um, and I'll just wait for people to populate. I can see them in the bottom right-hand corner. So jump into there. Um, if you're on campus as well, I can see over at St. Albans, someone is there. I can't see whom. Um, 
Gary, is that you? Sorry, it's really small for me. Yeah, Gary, Vince, and Liam. Oh, guys, how are you? Good. We we we, we have devices with us, so good, we'll. Yeah. Uh... Awesome. Yep. Yeah, so jump on through your device there, um, and when you've uh, you've got that ready to go, I'm going to simply ask you a very quick question. And the first thing is, based on your own experiences and your own aptitudes. How long would it take you to cut this orange that you see on the screen into eight even pieces? Some of you might go, oh, that's pretty simple, can do that. No worries. Uh, others it might be, oh, come on. That's in days, by the way. <laughs> so one or two or three people want to be smart and say, yeah, we're going to take our time and cut it into even pieces. What's the... What's the Error of margin. Oh, sorry, margin, <laughs> margin of error. The, mar the margin of error? Oh, I guess it's dependent on the person, you know. <laughs> good to hear from you as well, mate, by the way. I hope you're well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, good. So we've got seven responses. We've got a lot more people in the room, guys. I want you all to participate with this one. Again, this is going to be short and sharp, and I promise you there is some learning in this, hopefully. Um, so please open it up on your browser and uh, insert that one. Eight responses that we've got in total. That's about half of us in the group. So please, yeah, open it up. Let's go. Let's see it. Um, if you can see on my screen as well, the majority obviously are on that lower end point, you know, under a day. So over a day, would maybe love to have an offline discussion there about your process. Um, maybe there's something there that we're, uh, that we're all missing. So we can sort of see that most there have erred towards, you know, one day there. So again, relatively simple exercise, well, for most of us here today, and that's sort of, you know, speaking to, to one day there. So um, if I was to sort of jump it up a notch and I said to you instead, how long would it take you to grow an orange and then cut it up into eight even pieces? What would you sort of say then? Sixty-five. Anyone else got any other ideas? And again, don't fall for what people have done. Use your own ideas, your own beliefs and expertise there to, uh, to come at this one. There's seven people submitted. Let's go. Let's keep it going. I want to make sure this is, you know, relatively fast. Nine, average of 286. We can also see some have gone for, you know, just under 60, some 100, 180. Keep going, we can probably get one or two more in, 12, that's really good. All right, so I guess before right, a little bit more simpler, we had more people with around one, one to two, thereabouts, um, and it was quite concentrated, right? We've maybe increased the volatility slightly, the uncertainty, there's more effort here. And of course, what are we seeing? A little bit more volatility in the responses. Um, so whilst we have a much higher average, um, with obviously a lot going beyond tree 65, and that's obviously, we need to ask deeper questions, um, but we are seeing some increased volatility there. So if I was to again, execute, like take it up to another level altogether, if we were to grow an orange on the moon and then cut it into eight pieces, what would you then say? And again, you might ask, why the hell would you like to grow an orange on the moon? That defeats the purpose, that's fine. Um, but again, from your own experience, how long would that roughly take? <laughs> With obviously people going 365 days is probably not enough and we need a whole lot more Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Yes. Yep, nine, 10, maybe we get one or two. I think we're sort of getting the very rough idea though. So the point, the point here is that the more uncertain our environment, the estimates that we do put in become less reliable or accurate over time. And that forces us, of course, to understand more about the problem, more about the solution, therefore more time in order to provide a more accurate estimation. So when dealing with some of these problems, and you would all face this in various ways and in different arenas too, some of the problems you solve might be quite basic or simple. Others might be more complex and requiring more help between squads. And the thing here is that by not recognizing the level of uncertainty there, 
we're throwing estimates, you know, through to different stakeholders and other groups there and, and still equating them, you know, in the same way. And that, of course, comes with more risk to what we try and accomplish together. So we often work in, you know, quite complex environments, uh, complicated environments as well. And it therefore calls into question about, well, what techniques should we really use in order to get the most use of our time and to generate the best outcomes for our customers? Um, and hopefully we don't have to do something like growing an orange on the moon and cutting it into eight pieces. So what's the technique that we're normally used to doing um, can, is referred to in a number of different ways. Um, I, I guess one of the simplest ones comes to mind is, is absolute estimation. And that's generally using time as a key measure for a particular task or set of tasks. Uh, and they generally, again, work great for simple environments where we can follow best practice where we know upfront about what the problem is, how we're going to solve it. There's limited, I guess, dependencies on others, other potential risk factors that could alter those views. Um, and therefore, estimating in time, like if that is the environment, is the perfect way to do it. Um, but you can, of course, argue that our world is becoming more interconnected, more complex, and, and therefore, more time is now going to be required to follow this same technique. Um, and, uh, you know, depending on your environment again, you know, you might spend a lot of time being asked for things uh, around how long will this take? Um, will this be achievable by this date? Um, when there are too many variables that are outside of your control or your squad's control. So unfortunately, that technique when scaled or applied to complex environments can assume that humans are also robots. Right, and then if we say we're going to take an hour to do this task, it assumes for that full hour we're going to solely concentrate on that activity and nothing else. And I'm sure we could all agree that in a COVID world now where we're working from home, we've got multiple demands to attend to, whether it's personal or professional, disruption is a common factor amongst our lives. Therefore, dedicating complete focus 100% of the time is getting harder and harder makes estimates even harder to do following this technique. So summing up, I suppose, you know, some of those limitations around absolute estimation. And remember, it is still a valid practice in simple environments with low uncertainty or low risk. But again, it does require all of those unknowns to be known in order to be accurate. It requires heavy time investment up front, and that is by far the most important resource we have today. And once committed to, it's very difficult to change. We say this is going to take, you know, five days. Um, it is taken on face value uh, and it's thrown into plans and it's therefore taken with some degree of certainty and, and obviously that causes challenges where we might be starting to go off track, um, therefore adding to pressure and stress. Um, to combat that, they're often padded. So we might think that, yeah, okay, it'll take five days, but, but we'll go, no, 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 it's gonna take eight days or 10 days or 30 days or whatever it is, because we don't wanna set it too low and get it wrong and you know have a bit of a tough time, so we inflate it. And that does ourselves an injustice on what our skill sets are potentially capable of. It's not targeting those actual challenges in the environment that could derail us, therefore causing mistrust, right, in terms of reality versus, uh, um, no, yeah, I suppose what we're sort of portraying through to stakeholders and what we're actually capable of. And lastly, they're generally determined by one person, um, you know, generally with the, the adequate authority and or experience. So it's a subjective view on terms of, you know, in terms of how long something might take. Um, it's sort of rarely done as a thing. So what can we sort of do about this? Um, multiple ways to, to skin this one, um, but I guess within Agile ways of working, there is a good technique there. And some of you within your teams have already started to practice this, which is awesome. This might just take or elevate this to the next level. Uh, and that's around relative estimation. So it is a quicker, you know, some could argue more accurate and qualitative way of evaluating the complexity, risk and effort of a particular piece of work against something that we have done in the past. So it's following, it, it's got its roots grounded in empiricism and it's something that allows us to say, well, we did this in the past, we think that this piece of work is somewhat similar and we can determine where it might differ. Therefore, if we follow what we did here and maybe make a couple of tweaks, then this, what we're estimating here, is more accurate because we're relying on that past data. Um, it's a technique that is built on 
progressive precision. So I suppose if we sort of, you know, take this understanding of relative estimation a little bit further, it's about progressive precision. We can't know everything up front, because if we do, we'd spend all of our time planning and in workshops and understanding those problems and we wouldn't get as much work done. So it's based on having a little bit of information up front and as we develop and learn more about it, you know, through our different rituals, and that was, I guess, to the bottom point there, around big room planning, sprint planning, backlog grooming, those are points where we can refine these estimates. Um, so it's not just you do it once and that's it. No, it does become more and more accurate as we sort of understand more and more about it. So it, it, it is refined continually. Um, relative estimation is expressed in nominal values or points and it follows the Fibonacci sequence. Um, and that's, you know, one, two, three, five, eight, 11, 13, et cetera, but we'll, we'll cut it off at eight. And it's simply saying here that when we're measuring the complexity, the risk, the effort of our work, we'll assign it a value here that we think is reasonable because I'll explain shortly about how we apply that thinking to our sprints, but it's something that the whole team agrees on. So there's a couple of things that we've got to do in order to accomplish that. However, by doing this together, you're eliminating somewhat of the subjectivity and you're relying more on comparing it against something else. Very easy to say whether, you know, this, this apple is twice as big as this one, um, or is it three times bigger than this one, even if it's uh, a broad understanding that the team has, it means that you can move forward and get to doing quicker and learning from that experience tailoring your estimation ability as time goes on. Um, if we don't do that, then of course we're going to get caught estimating the individual tasks, how long they take, adding it all up and providing that through. And as more evolves, you might go, oh yeah, we've got more tasks that we've got to do. We didn't think of that. Therefore, more tasks, more time, estimates continue to go up and up and up and up and up. So it's trying to take some of that time away. So as I mentioned, it does equate to the complexity, the risk, the effort that we have, that we believe that this thing is gonna comprise of when we get to doing, um, in order to get done. And done is a very, very key word there that I'll just spend a couple of extra minutes on um, because it's, it sets the, uh, the parameters for how far we take something. And again, we refine this consistently and again and again, and we'd be open with one another, say through our retrospectives about our ability to estimate, including all the things that are outside of our control that, you know, blew things out, but we bring that back in and we refine, we refine that together. From these points that we, you know, generate and we assign to our work, because we do work in two weekly sprints, it allows us to determine velocity. And velocity refers to, which I'll explain yet in more depth shortly, but velocity refers to how many points we can complete or get done, right, in a two week time frame. Because we follow a consistent pace two weeks at a time, what we throw into the sprint and what we classify as getting done allows us to measure what we're capable of achieving on average in a two week sprint. Not absolute, but roughly, right? Um, and again, we want to make sure that we're continuing to refine this again and again and again. So it's all well and good, you know, okay, if we measure working points and we want to improve the simplicity of our approach. But again, the goal across our sprints is to get as much of the, as much high valued work done as possible with respect to our capacity. We're not going to kill ourselves working 10 hours and 10 hours a day. And I know some of you do do that but it's really about understanding what our true capacity is and getting as much work done as we can that meets the quality standards defined by your team. So through relative estimation, we can simplify the size of a piece of work using our experience and measuring that completion across the sprints um, so that hopefully we can get a better understanding of that velocity that to forecast future work as well. So in order to start doing, you know, relative estimation and going, okay, what points do we sort of assign for different pieces of work? There's sort of two things that you do need to have up front in order to make this process easier for yourself. The first one is to understand what done means to your team. So definition of done, you know, at DOD um, is considered a checklist of things that need to be completed in order to say that this user story or this task or this bug fix 
um, is considered done. Now, depending on the work that you do, the environment that you operate in, that can, that, that's very different from one team to another. So you define what that means for your team. But it generally consists of, well, if we're gonna work on this user story, how we design it, how we develop it, how we test it, how do we document it, how we deploy it, <laughs> approve it, God, everything, right? All of that gets thrown into a simple checklist. And this infers what, sub, what subtasks you might have to do throughout the sprint, other help that you might need from others. Without this understanding of how far we're gonna take this thing, it makes it very hard to quantify size, right? Or effort or risk or complexity. So you probably work with user stories and tasks and there's probably different types of it as well because you do look, you guys do look after a broad range of different uh, product or, or service offerings. So the goal is to sit down as a team, quiet environment and understand what is our definition of done. And it is a template, it's something for you to follow and apply to each user story or task or bug or whatever else that you have to do. Because then you can go, well, if we say bare minimum, we're gonna do this, 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 and this, then okay, that will speak to the size of the effort involved. Without it, every user story or task is gonna be slightly different and different activities and you lose that sense of relativity, right? Because there isn't a consistent benchmark. So if there's one thing for you to all go back and have a think about is what does done mean to your team and how can you define it so that you can apply your user stories or other work to that definition um, so that you can then start to quantify size in your own hands. The second prerequisite in order to estimate work in a relative sense is to develop reference stories, templates for different sizes that you can look at and during your different rituals, whether it's big room planning or sprint planning, you can compare and you can go, we think that this one is quite similar to this, or it's a little bit more complex than this one. And to go, we're going to go with a three or we're going to go with a five. Again, the point value is determined by the team and it's about how much stuff you can get done in two weeks. And therefore you can plan for the future because you're generating that consistent pace. So reference stories are, are a really good way just again for you as a team to define what these different point values mean to you and there is no formula no formula sorry that uh, is generic enough that you can just use and piggyback off it's different for every single team so how can you build these within your own squad um, a quick little way just that you can go through together in terms of a technique is look at five user stories or tasks that you've done in the past and that vary in size and complexity and throw them on a board or if you're there physically together, just print them on paper, whatever it is, or in Excel, doesn't matter, but get five. And for each of those five, you're gonna rank them from one to five. So ranking, so one being the smallest, um, five being the most across three different categories. The first one is around complexity and that speaks to the level of research, analysis, communication and collaboration between multiple squads, i.e. the more people that are involved in this, in solving this story or this task, the more complex it becomes because you can have some more of those dependencies. Um, so again, so weight each of those user stories against that complexity from one to five. And you do this as a team together, so you all decide on it and work through that together. Do the same thing for risk, which speaks to the degree of unknowns uh, about what we're trying to do, um, the rework that you might have had involved, the fixing defects, the waiting time on others, uh, even the stakeholder profile, right? So if you've got very active stakeholders and they want to change things again and again and again, then that equates to risk because obviously it's slowing us down to getting it done. So um, evaluate it based on risk. And lastly, they're about effort. And effort speaks to the perceived time involved in order to meet the definition of done. So if I, and you might find you know, they'll, they might vary slightly in each of those five stories, but what it allows you to do hmm. is sum them all up, total them all up and rank them from you know top to bottom, biggest, most scariest to simplest, easiest, you know, no worries at all. But it's giving you a point of reference, right? And this is just, I guess, you know, a, a simple place to start from. They like, don't just sit there and add them all up and go, yeah, okay, that all looks good. Let's convert them into story points so that we can understand what, you know, a three means to us or a one, um, and we go from there. So you pick the middle one, whatever the middle one is out of the five, and that's why working with five works pretty well. 
and give it a three. And again, this is a starting point for all of you. It means that the middle story that we found here was pretty average, goes in the middle and that has a three. You can then work up and down the Fibonacci sequence there, one, two, three, five, and eight, and you can develop those, those templated story point values. So that you know that story B in this case equates to an eight. And I know that we generally don't go to eights because we always say, you know, if it's bigger than a five, cut it down. But you might run into that situation, right? So that, that might spur on the, the, the need to, to break it down further. And we know that in this case, story D is generally a one. So when it comes to your backlog grooming, your sprint planning, big room planning, you've got all of these user stories or tasks to you know, size up, estimate. You can then simply compare them against these and say, is this one as big as story A? Yes or no? And you can go through that, that process and quickly do it because you've got something to reference on. And this is based on your experience um, collectively as a team, provided that you have a definition of done, right? And that's how the two go hand in hand. So it means that you can stop viewing a user story independently and go, oh, how big is this one? How much effort is going to be involved? You can apply it to templates that are custom built for your team. And yes, they'll change over time, 100% they'll change. But it means that you can start practicing and start learning and start refining your techniques together, which is where the true value of this technique really comes in. So you can compare and contrast, discuss and decide and commit. Now, if we get it wrong, we learn from it. If we get it right, we learn from it. And we factor that into our continuous improvement moving forward. So I get that I've gone over again because I've talked way too much and I know that you guys might have to get out as well quite soon. Um, but bringing this back as well to how we help this with our future planning as well, because we're able to then go through and assign points to different tasks, and then we can go and assign them into a sprint. If we're able to then go, ah, oh, how much work can we get done, right? This is our velocity. And that changes over time because every sprint is different. Sometimes people are away, they're sick, unfortunately. Something last minute has come from another vendor or a P1 issue has blown everything out of the water. Everything can change. So we're never gonna commit what we say in a sprint to yes, that is exactly what we're gonna do and it's never gonna change. The point is that we have to factor that volatility into our planning, but over time, we can start to get a general sense on what we're capable of as a team and what we're not. We all commit, you know, I'm sure, from best intentions, probably a little bit too much. You can sort of see, and this is a report out of JIRA, right? That the gray bar is what we committed to in the sprint. What was green was uh, what we completed or got done. And there's a big disparity between it. Always leave with best intentions, of course. But the goal is to just try and find parity between those two or as close as possible so that we can understand what we are capable of. Um, and where we do differ, again, we have the conversation about it. We should be learning from our experiences through our retrospectives continuously and seeking guidance and support on how to get better. We can never control our environment 100%. However, we can seek to learn at every opportunity. And that's, again, the ethos of, of the Ignite way of working. So you might go, okay, well, you know, sort of forgetting a little bit, you know, something here and we've got, you know, a project that has got other demands or we've got um, a stakeholder that needs something urgent and they still ask the question, when will this be done? Um, can't get away from it because we do need to work with dates. We have semesters and we've got times where students come in and there is criticality around that. So how can we apply the points and the sprints to understanding what we can complete, you know, over the course of the future? And again, guys, I know that it's 1.31. If you do have to go, please jet off. Um, this is being recorded so you can catch the last parts of the session as well. Uh, but if you can stick with us, that's awesome. But the goal is to fuse our concept of relative estimation with reality and applying ourselves to what is possible over a period of time, working towards critical dates where we need to, um, so how can we roughly do it? So to exemplify this particular urge, and sorry Mona, that's probably going to trigger you that image now that I think about it, um, is if we have an example where we've got a senior stakeholder or another team or another project and they've come to us and they've said, hey, we really need some help with this one, um, there's a bit of a, a scenario here and I'm keen to get information from you guys as to whether this is achievable or not. So if we've been given an epic to complete or there's an epic that's spun up, 
and we've identified that there's 10 user stories that need to be done by the 31st of August. Our next sprint, next Wednesday, 20th of July, is when we're, we're sprinting off again. And uh, the team, you know, has decided to place those items at the top of the backlog. So using our definition of done and having reference stories, we've determined that the to you know, that the story points for each of those, those 10 user stories equates to 41 story points. Looking back and what we've accomplished previously, our, our average estimation, you know, so averaging the last three sprints, has amounted to 12 story points completed there. I want to know from you guys, from your perspectives, is that achievable or not? How would you answer this question with those three responses below? We've got four responses there. Looking for a couple more. I'm keen to hear what uh, each of you uh, think about this particular challenge. Because this is pretty common, right? This, this happens in a lot of different squads. Uh, we may not you know, go down to the depths of the user stories and the story points yet, um, but uh, squeezing something in with tight timeframes, all of us are subjected to that in one way or another. Eight responses there. Most deviating for the last one. Nine, can we get one more maybe? If there's one more there in the room, please go through it. All right, we might call it off at nine. So the actual answer to this one is that there is no answer. And that's like, oh, Sam, what was the point of that exercise? The key thing here is to look at our environment and to understand what's really important. If the epic in this case is that critical to business operations and all of it has to be done, we would look at our capacity, we'd look at our velocity and using our estimation, we would deduce that on face value, this isn't achievable, right? Because if we look at, you know, 12 storage points and we allow for a little bit of, you know, slack in that, it's going to equate to about three and a half sprints, which gets us sort of, you know, towards um, uh, the early parts of September, right? So not possible. But if it's important, it forces the question that we either need to improve our resourcing, right? We need to add more capacity to our teams um, or something else has to be done. External forces required in order to get there. Still valid though, but again, we can't say no, we can't do it all. It forces a different question to be asked. And they might go, oh, well, there's no money, right? So, okay, you get into a bit of a, a conundrum here, but um, no one said, no, we can't do it, you know, put the Epic on hold. Like, again, that might also be a valid answer because maybe all 10 are required. And in which case there's a bit of a gridlock and it needs to be escalated. So again, it's coming from the perspective that if you guys are looking at your data, you're looking at what you can achieve or not. And if you think that there might be some risk towards completing this using what you have, then it gets flagged, it gets escalated and it gets discussed. It deviates from the idea that we need to continue to do everything possible with the little that we have. And if we can really force the view on what we can do and what we can't, we can therefore make it more reliable. So I know that that is, some challenge, that that is challenging for some of you in your environments, um, but this is based on empiricism. It's based on data, right, to drive decision making. But most of you here answered, and you know, it's probably the, the obvious one, some of it can be done, perhaps not all of it, so prioritize it. We probably can get seven of the 10 done, maybe, maybe six, but at least you're trying to focus on the highest valued work possible um, and working with your stakeholder groups. So whilst, you know, plans are great, let's have this, this is what we want to accomplish, but we always have to remember that they change. We can't predict, you know, what's going to happen, you know, next month, hell, even later on today, but we can continue to survey our environment, lead with our best guesses and judgment together and lead with the data wherever we can because it's there. It's not people's opinions, it's not plucked out of thin air, it's based on our past experience. That's where um, relative estimation can really become extremely powerful. It's defined by the team, it's based on what we can do and it's universally understandable. So a couple of key things with working with stakeholders there, you know, and again, this is such a difficult thing to do because every stakeholder group is different. Factor in capacity shifts. So again, during your big room planning, during sprint planning or backlog grooming, is anybody away today? Is anyone, you know, not feeling so great? Think you might be, you know, away? 
are we at the start of the semester or the end or have we got something else you know in the university calendar that could disrupt our progress by looking at our environment and factoring that into our velocity and things like that making changes and standing by it it means that it's more accurate it's more connected to the present if we don't do that and we continue to just use velocity right on face value it does also set the the wrong expectation too um, and that sort of ties in with the second point there about, well, if we think that this is our average and things like that, and we've got people perhaps away, adjust it and lead in with that and go, well, if we wanted to keep it to these 15 user stories in sprint one, is that really going to be achievable? Maybe we have to reduce it to six. And if we get them done, okay, pull more work in, that's fine. Bring it up from the next sprint, that's all okay. But avoid over commitment. Um, because you'll find that that follows you from one sprint to the next. It doesn't make you feel great because you feel that you're not hitting your targets despite doing amazing work. Um, and it sends the wrong message to, you know, the senior stakeholders, other parts of leadership, etc. So if we run into situations, and sorry guys, I apologise again for taking more of your time. Um, but when it comes to, uh, I guess, working on user stories and tasks, etc., and uh, you're committing, you've started to use relative estimation, hopefully, and applying that learning to your own teams. Um, you've got different stakeholders. Now, whether, you know, it's, it's Zorin, it's Neville, it's Stephen, it, it's um, uh, whoever it is outside of, the, uh, outside of our walls, include them in the journey through the sprint reviews um, to showcase what it is that we've accomplished. If we can rely on our definition of done, we say that yes, these two things, they were done, here's how it roughly works and here's how we you know, sort of meet those conditions. Um, it really does mean that we can show off that value and people become more focused on the developing product or service than the time estimate. And they might be more likely to de-scope stuff because they can see working product or service and they can make better decisions around what is truly needed and what is not. Everything is high urgency, high importance. We've got to do everything. So we've got to try and shift some of that notion as well so that we can focus on the highest valued stuff as often as possible. And through that process, we relentlessly pursue improvement. We don't assume that our velocity is fixed, but we go, oh, how could we improve this one? If we found that our waiting time was excessive, if we found that uh, requirements change throughout the sprint, we can combat those challenges with why and what can we do about it and ask for that support. Whether it's from the Ignite support squad, it's from other prominent people across ITS, we focus that on attitude to how can we get this better, not this defines us and this is what we are. Um, again, we can improve the velocity, we can improve the amount of great work that we do and, and obviously that's got a lot of other benefits there as well. So lastly, just before I wrap up, and apologies again guys for going OT, a couple of things to watch out for when, when doing relative estimation. Um, avoid converting work into time um, and saying that, okay, if we have these user stories and we're gonna cut them up into all these tasks, let's assign minutes and stuff like that to everything there so we can equate the time component. If we do that, then we're losing our sense of relativity we're committing more time to understanding how big the work is for reporting purposes. And an individual will do that, right? Because generally the individuals each own different subtasks. It will take longer, it will be more complicated, but instead, if we just rise above that, stay with relativity, apply it to templated stories or other things we've done in the past, it means we can estimate quicker. And over time, through continuous improvement, mm -hmm. we have become more accurate and reliable. Secondly, there just when you are going through this as a team, um, you might have different opinions. You know, you might look at this and, you know, Nikita, you might say that this thing here is a five. Um, uh, you know, Ravi might say that this is a two. You'll each have different reasons for that estimation. So again, have the discussion. Don't settle for the middle, which might be three, but you've each got different reasons. And if you ignore those, then you're sweeping the issues under the rug. So have the challenging conversation, make it based on merit, and commit to something that you all believe in. Because again, you can learn from that experience. Um, sort of spoke about those prerequisites there about you know definition of done and those reference stories. They're great to have, and you might find that you want to change them often because you're learning more about your environment. The only challenge with changing them too frequently is that you lose the, the, the relevancy of the previous data that you collect. 
So if you change what definition it done is and it becomes twice as big as what it was before, you might find that like your estimation abilities will also change with that, right? And if you do it across the PI multiple times, your velocity, you know, won't become consistent. It might be like a 10 one sprint, then it might jump up to a 20 or it might go down to a three, depending on the effort involved. So in that case, set something up at the start of say PI three, if you feel that you're in a position to do so, trial it for the PI and then change it at the end. And every three months you can get better and make good changes and improve that practice together. Um, second, lastly as well, if you're not clear on the user story or a task um, or, or a bug, don't estimate it just yet. You need to understand what it is you're trying to accomplish as a team. And if that understanding is not there, the estimates will have little use. They won't be accurate. So push back on your product owner or someone that is defining those user stories in a nice way and point out where the confusion is so that you can estimate together correctly. And lastly, tied to the very, very first point, avoid estimating based on people's experiences. Um, you know, Vinay, you're obviously extremely good at what you do. Uh, a lot of deep experience there, a task perhaps for you. Um, might be done a lot quicker compared to someone that's just starting it for you. Um, and again, that might disrupt what the true estimate could be for someone that's going to pick it up. So again, rising above that, that subjectivity there about what, you're as, what you as a person is capable of and applying that to your reference stories. Again, that's the relative component to this. It means that you can sort of separate yourself from that look at applying it to your templates and go, yeah, we think it's going to be this one or that one. And again, if you get it wildly wrong, learn from it. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's pretty much it, guys. Thanks for sticking with me an extra 15 minutes. Um, it is a big, big topic, and I'm sure you've got a lot of questions there. But remember, your estimation abilities following this relative practice, they get better and stronger over time. It's hard to do at the start because it's foreign, but through regular practice and ongoing conversation, you can get better at it. And the more that we do it and the more reliable our data becomes through velocity, through our retrospectives and things like that, it can start to be relied upon by stakeholders, other senior leaders, and then we start talking in terms of sprints. It might take three sprints to get this one done, which equates to six weeks, plus or minus, you know, half a sprint. Um, it can help prioritize whether we should do this epic over this epic, if we can look at this and go, yeah, we think it's gonna take this long. So it's trying to give you more time back fundamentally with uh, putting more pressure on team leads, on managers, on project managers to go, yeah, it's gonna be this long, this is what we're gonna do. Um, the pressure that these people feel would just be enormous. So let's take that away, let's focus on team effort and let's apply simplistic concepts that are empirically built. Um, and that's that's pretty that's pretty much it, guys. That's very very hard to do, but I wanted to reiterate the support is there. Um, and then Richard, you just asked the question: How do we know that the same matrix is applied for assessing story points across squads? The key thing is is that your squad with SAS will be different to Phoenix. It'll be different to Scientific Art. Um, so these are guiding principles on how to develop this. But only you and your team can come up with with your own matrix. Again, we're leaning in on the core categories there about what drives, you know, size, and that's looking at the research and stuff like that. And that's, you know, complexity, risk and effort. But your determination towards your work is done inherently by you. There isn't, a, again, a formula that we can give you that's going to work. So you've got to explore that yourself. And if you're not able to do it, we can work through it together, you know, along with the rest of the crew, and we can help you discover that one. So um, I've taken more than enough time. If you do have other questions there, please get in touch, have the conversation with us and go, how might that work for you? Again, it's about giving time back, improving accuracy as time goes on through learning um, and relying on our past experiences as a team to drive the future. So thanks very much guys for your time today. Really, really appreciate it. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and we'll see you again next time. Thanks very much, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Sam, thank you so much. <clears throat> Thanks for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Thank no you. worries. Thanks. thanks, Gary. Thanks, Vince. Thanks, Liam. Good to see you guys.